essentially, if you can bring as much data on chain as possible in as secure a way as possible, in as easy way as possible, then we think that actually there's a massive proliferation of use cases for blockchain that can happen. So one of the most exciting things, I think, is a, a protocol that someone has you know, come to me with, which is cross-chain relay secured by Flare. Relaying things like the FTSO prices and, and rewarding the FTSOs and potentially their delegators for that. Um, and, and, and rewarding the FTSOs and potentially their delegators for that. Welcome to the DeFi Standard, and this is Mickey B. Fresh. With Flare's cross-chain composability, developers can build interoperable dApps that can access the value, liquidity, and information of multiple blockchains through a single deployment on Flare. This is made possible by Flare's State Connector which is the first consensus protocol purpose-built for external blockchain data, and it is able to securely prove the state of other blockchains in a decentralized manner and provide data to dApps on Flare. This is what secures the relayer. With the power of the state connector added to the time series oracle, Flare has created a set of native open protocols which provide secure building blocks for the next generation interoperability. Flare enables cross-chain interoperability with the security of multi-chain, faster, universal, and more secure. Flare will connect everything. Safely relay any information, including off-chain data, between any set of chains secured by the state connector. This gives developers total decentralized DAP composability, all secured by Flare. Again, nothing comes close to what we are building with Flare. This is why our strapline has changed to connect everything. The state connector enables a model of staked relay of data between multiple chains, including Flare, which powers secure two-way interoperability across a network of chains. <clears throat> Instead of relying on governance, relay secured by the state connector will have automated slashing of faulty relay nodes through the state connector's ability to prove what any node has relayed to another chain. The RPC nodes that Flare has built out with the API portal and the network with the Google cluster and compute engine in the recent video that we went through, this is what is allowing them to create this interoperability because utility for something is more than just an asset. Utility doesn't come from an asset, it's not born with it. It needs the supporting applications, the protocols, the tools. And what have we been told since the beginning? What is the fact? The value is in the protocol. Really good for relay, you know, really good for securing a relay. Let's, you know, think about a relay structure. I have a number of relay nodes. How do I know they're honest? I dumb, but how do I make them honest? When I make them stake on Flare, and when they're dishonest, I can prove that they're dishonest because I've got the data on one chain, I've got the data on another chain, and I can prove that the, on Flare that this data that they should have relayed doesn't match. So then I can slash their stake on Flare. So I can build a relay service that we think that data, bringing really good data to the to the to blockchains, uh, can can kind of push forward. Now that's a very basic idea. But you know, if you think about the entire blockchain ecosystem, we think by bringing data, we massively expand what can, and we're very excited by that. Later. 
But what does this mean for somebody who's delegating? What it ultimately means is if those relayers are going to earn fees, and that's generating revenue. That's like a business. It's financial markets. That's what we need. Not is Flare the first main chain that acts as an Oracle network? It's absolutely the first main, main layer one that acts as a data provider network. The core aspect is how you secure that Oracle. Okay. The key difference between us and other Oracles is that our Oracle is secured at the blockchain layer with the main token of the blockchain. And that is a totally different uh, way of securing an Oracle. And in our view, and I think it, you know, it's fairly obvious, um, a substantially more secure way of securing an Oracle. And at the root of this ability is the idea of shilling, Shelling's point is that you're rewarding for good behavior. So there is an idea of the proof of stake with the slashing, but the core prices and the data feed is generated by the opposite of that. You're rewarding with the network's tokens, like miners earned new Bitcoin. Well, data providers earn new FLR for producing good data and accurate data, not slashed for producing bad data, because it initially gets into the network on the incentive of doing something the most accurate and you're incentivized economically to not act bad. And even the idea of that went down with the colluding, it was also just get, it only got better data. So that was just a system design and it's part of the process of rolling this out. And he says later in this that six months is when you'll see the full implementation of the FTSO, the testers, the validators will have staking, which will be included with that. We only have one set of voters right now. So this thing's going to be, there's no other Oracle system that's a layer one. That's no other Oracle system can replicate a layer one security because it's the consensus, the network, the delegators, and then you can have the F asset voters. Once that is, that other voter is there and you're going to be both. Likely most people will then balance that out because they have competing interests in voting and they'll vote for different reasons because they're not financially motivated. That will balance out the colluding part. But the data has been spot on accurate and a protocol or a DAP on top of a layer one cannot produce something like that. So Flare has the opportunity to be the data provisioning network of the blockchain because it could, and it's EVM. So it's going to easily connect. And of course, for us, there's obviously we're always working on how to make Flare better. We have an endless sort of bank of things that we'll be working on. I think I'm most excited about getting the State Connector launched on Flare, that use State from other chains and use those either directly on Flare to do something or use those with other blockchains for interoperability. So one of the biggest grants that we will be essentially vesting on a development team will be over the formulation and execution of a generic data relay service using Flare. So this is quite an interesting proposition, whereby someone could come along and use the state connector to essentially slash relay nodes that propagate information between different chains because this makes essentially a data relay service representable broadly as a smart contract on Flare. And that kind of encapsulates the exact thing that we've built Flare for, which is to give you access to all this data, such that all you need to do to build something complex is to build a smart contract on Flare. That's impressive and so exciting at the same time. So exciting at the same time. <laughs> Uh, another developer uh, is building like a, a relay system, which allows an, essentially a, a set of relay nodes to be staked on Flare. And for those relay nodes to relay between any chain, we do have a number of parties that have expressed an interest in building a relay system and in fact have some really very interesting thoughts on how to do it. Uh, we're also looking at working with some of the existing relay networks that do exist out there. Hugo's mentioned on multiple occasions, as we've seen in these videos, 
about his excitement for this relayer and what it's capable of. Because this is something, if done right and continuously grown in decentralization and in accuracy, can become the standard for probabilistic data. Because like he said, it's ultimately, it's secured by the network's token value, but it utilizes the state connector to then be that eye in the sky that could determine if they're lying or they're not because it's two Oracle systems. It brings in the price feeds, which go through the FTSO submissions, and it's as accurate as down to the fifth decimal point on some assets right now. So when we hear of this collusion talk, that's really getting down to the most accurate of accurate prices. The Oracle itself is functioning phenomenal. It's the reward distribution that needs to be tweaked and is being worked on, but the actual accuracy is beyond anything that's out there in the amount of oracles that are submitting data. And as more data comes online, they're going to advance the capabilities of the FTSO to FTSO V2. And this data can then be relayed. And this could be used also in applications on Flare for derivatives, for peer-to-peer -peer betting, and other financial products, because you need this data from outside the network that comes in that could then allow for utility for financial markets and other things to take place on Web3. So utilizing Web2 data and prices in Web3. So right. the FTSO, the, the pricing has been uh, really very accurate. Uh, it is designed to be able to withstand a very large amount of malfeasance amongst the participants. So essentially, it would take a huge amount of corruption in the Oracle for uh, the Oracle's price to become degraded. That data to be corrupted. Exactly, because it's all secured by the token. So it's the same idea as how much corruption a network would need, how many corrupt participants a network would need in order to become corrupt. So it's like the idea of a 51% attack. Whereas these ideas are not inherent in any other Oracles. Uh, there is often trusted, or if they're using their own token on a blockchain, uh, it's very, very much harder to get that level of decentralization. It's very hard to be able to get so many participants. Um, the, most, most smart contract platforms could not handle the number of participants we have and the amount of data we have. So that's incredibly important. It's very powerful to really understand what they're getting at with the specifically the relayer and why using the two systems, the two Oracle systems or data provision protocols together with Flare is the ultimate kind of solution. And it's why it's there for the targeting first, why he keeps saying, well, Relay is going to be the first thing. Relay, why is that? Because that's something that's produced on Flare. The data is provisioned. So you have probabilistic data. There's no one price of Bitcoin or one price of XRP. You have many sources. And by having 80 oracles plus, so that's just a start, there'll be hundreds soon. You're able to get a very decentralized, accurate reading of the network. And you're not counting on just one oracle, two oracles. So that produces an actual price feed that comes out. That's the median price feed. And that can be relayed. So now relayers, they could either be the FTSOs or they could not be. I think many of the well we'll see but likely it's probably the ftsos will do it and i don't see why they wouldn't it would be an ideal thing to then message to another network those prices so because they have the least incentive to be malicious now say it wasn't them and it was some other entity nodes how do you make sure that they relay the correct prices the state connector since it's observe it's on flare so it could read the actual price that gets gets uh, generated from it will be say twenty two thousand four hundred forty four dollars and sixty two cents of Bitcoin at this time, and if the relayer 
is extremely off in their price because all they need to do is just pull the price from the FTSO and then relay it. And likely they're going to have to be FTSOs as I think about it because they're going to have to be on flare to do that. And then it could slash them if they produce the wrong price because the state connector knows. So it's like the all seeing eye of the data that's produced by flare. So that's what makes this possible. Something like Chainlink can't do that. It's just not feasible. Uh, so, um, you know, I think the FTS is a, a fantastic oracle. Uh, I, it'll be, it's, it's, it's been uh, a great success on Songbird. And I, I really think that if we can open it up to the broader uh, crypto ecosystem, I think it's a, a potentially very interesting idea that applications all across the ecosystem could potentially be using uh, the prices that are delivered by this really wonderfully decentralized um, Oracle on, on that is secured and really uh, forms the, the Flare network. So were that to happen, uh, certainly there would be great network effects. And in DeFi, so DeFi, we see derivatives are starting to get bigger and bigger in the broader DeFi space. This next phase of a run-up, DeFi is going to absolutely explode, but it still needs more of those real-world applications. But expect that. That is the biggest use case in crypto right now. There is nothing else. It's not payments. It's not NFTs, which are two and three, but it's DeFi. Even as the XRP community, you need to understand that because that's what you're going to see on the XRP ledger. You're going to see and the side chains is DeFi. Two uh, protocols. The first is the FTSO, which is a highly performant price oracle. Could, could be used for other things like weather data, indices, that kind of thing. Uh, second protocol is the state connector. State connector allows Flare to understand uh, and securely come to consensus over information from other blockchains and potentially from the internet. So uh, price, internet data, blockchain data, all in one place with smart contracts. The benefit really to that is you're able to build applications with safe pricing and with data from other blockchains and potentially from the internet. We think that that leads to substantially better applications. You know, again, it's decentralized. It, um, you know, it operates with a large number of participants. Uh, it's embedded into the network, so it's part of the network. And this is where it gets its security from. So other Oracle services are, you know, generally, broadly, they, they don't derive their security from being participants in a blockchain with value at risk. This is a really important factor. Like, essentially, they, they sit on top of a blockchain. And broadly, that is why they have had to have a centralized model right so you've had to have you've had to basically trust oracles and the reason you've had to trust oracles is because because it's been too hard to engineer um essentially a system where there's where there's an economic reason for an oracle not to lie um this is why we've built flare we built flare to basically be a base layer for data secured by the layer itself. And I think I said earlier, that the most important thing about the state connector is it's not secured by proof of stake. So even though to get into the state connector, one will eventually have to put up some stake as being part of a validator, the, but the, the security properties of the system does not rely on that. Uh, and the reason why that's important is because imagine if you have a hundred million dollars worth of stake, but you've been asked to uh, confirm a transaction that has a value of a billion dollars. The stake over here is nowhere near enough to secure the value here. And so, whilst I won't go into it in too much depth here, the stake connector has a binary forking mechanism. This allows any minority set within the state connector, so the validators of the network, to essentially, uh, if, if, if the system becomes corrupt, to basically say the system is corrupt, 
we're not approving this new data. Here is a new version of Flare, which does not have the bad data embedded. This is the old version. This is the new version. And obviously, anyone that cares about essentially the data, about the applications that are leveraged from that data, about the value connected to that, they will migrate from the corrupt version to the, to the, to the version that does not have the bad data. So not only do we have the base staking uh, security, we have an additional level of security that allows in a, uh, in a, a, a case where the system itself becomes undermined, malicious. It allows uh, the, the system to essentially rectify itself without uh, causing loss to the applications and the users that are using that system. We're most proud of that because relative to other systems, whether you call it an Oracle or whether you call it a, an interoperability protocol, everything else is secured just with money. And we think, those, um, we think that security premise essentially is fundamentally flawed. Now, Flare's doing all the back end work to build that. Their fundamental foundational infrastructure to support a future cross-chain DeFi and applications that don't exist today. That's what they're building. So their protocols need to be absolutely 100% secure and by design. That's the first time he's really explained uh, the details of this relayer, that they're going to give a grant for it. And... It looks like Flare, the team, is not building it themselves. And what does this mean for us? It looks like a low-risk way for you to stake your FLR and still be able to earn the distribution and still be able to earn the delegation rewards and still be able to vote in governance with very low risk. Um, but this is a powerful... Uh, ambitious plan here because that's where that grant money is going to go because they're going to need multiple entities to spin this up. I mean, if somebody is able to accomplish a these apps that they build cross-chain, they're going to need to access data from all different networks, including Flare, and they need like this underlying, um, basically, uh, relay service between all the different networks. And that just goes with everything else that they're building. So this, they're putting all the pieces together to make the ultimate interoperability solution. And all three of them use FLR. So this is another use case for people just to take FLR, stake it, and earn foreign currencies. So what does that mean? You earn XRP, you earn BTC, you earn Ethereum. So that's the goal here is, you, you know, we're earning FLR from the distribution and the inflation rewards. Those are not true yields. They're yield, but this would be then real yield that you'd be earning for providing a service and doing that. Now, there's a different way to earn essentially foreign currency, so your XRP, your, even your Ethereum maybe. Um, and that is, we have the FTSO, this data provider, and people could stake against the data provider. So basically put some money into a smart contract and, and say, I'm going to deliver the price of um, Dogecoin against the dollar, and I'm going to deliver that to the Ethereum network. And I'm going to ask people on Ethereum to pay me some fraction of a of a penny for every 500 signals i deliver mm. and i'm going to stake uh i'm going to stake against that and if i'm wrong if i deliver a crap signal if i lie um you can take 50 percent of my stake per per time that i lie um and the stake connector can be the thing that determines whether you lied or not on the ethereum network and so that's a second way potentially to earn additional currency, additional foreign currency from your flare or from your songbird. And it's going to be interesting to see how fast they could get that spun up. Um, but 
another use case that's in the books for FOR out the gate. And now this doesn't count all of the dApps and DeFi that will be built around these. So if you offer these capabilities to dApps, now there's some DeFi protocols and be like, wait, I could get the data from every blockchain. I could get state from Web2 from the state connector, and I could pull from different blockchains, and I could have price feeds sent to me too. So that's something you can't access. Even Chainlink cannot provide that for you. Um, but this is a model that's been the idea of automatic slashing. To do that, you need to have the eye in the sky. And that's what the state connector could do. It could guarantee that, and it could verify if this price was right or wrong. It doesn't have to go to a committee and like some of those optimistic um, oracles where then somebody's got to prove it's wrong. It, it doesn't work like that. It just says this is wrong. And then somebody verifies that it's wrong. And then it gets automatically slashed. So this should expand the Oracle systems for Flare. It is a data provisioning network. Um, and this is what it should be doing. So I was glad to see that. But it's not Flare who's building it, though. It's they're putting up a grant for it. So this is they're trying to bring others in to build. So it will be interesting to see who will jump on that. And generating fees, earning other currencies outside because your value of the token is staked and is earning that. While you're simultaneously earning your delegation rewards, you're earning your distribution, that's all coming just to be able to earn more than of the fees outside. So generating that revenue, that's one way of doing it. There'll be others in the future. Things you could do is because you can see what's happened on another network, you could take the price from the FTSO, you could maybe stake against that price on in a smart contract on either Songbird or Flare, uh, and you could say, I'm going to deliver that price to another network like Ethereum. You got yourself a decentralized Oracle. Then the state connector can see whether you delivered that price, whether you delivered it at all, whether you delivered the right price at the right time, uh, whether you did it honestly. And you can then have automatic smart contract controlled slashing, and then you've got yourself an Oracle protocol. Really interesting, like cross-chain Oracle protocol. And now with Kraken getting, I want to touch on the Kraken settlement for a second. So they settled a fine with the SEC for $30 million, but I need to make, the, everyone needs to understand this clearly that Kraken was fined because they were kind of aggregating the staking. So even if they ran a validator, they would just offer the, their users 12% just to make it easy. But if they earned more, they just kept it. So they really didn't provide the disclosures to the customers of how they were actually coming to earning that interest and that yield. They just set up a percentage rate and whatever they just gave them, and then they kept the rest. And that's why they got fined. Now, Coinbase has not got rid of their staking program. They're going to continue because staking is not an unregistered security. It's not the actual staking. It's how they actually, it, the, the investment contract of how they aggregated the yield. It was a yield product and they basically were just offering 12% and they, it wasn't connected to the actual blockchain protocol. So no, staking is not going anywhere and actual on the chain blockchain, all this did was the the, decentralized finance of actual exploded that day. So this was not really an attack on the whole staking and crypto markets. And all it does is just push more people to decentralized technologies because you never are going to stop people from actually interacting with the blockchain because anyone who has an open internet connection can interact with the blockchain. You don't need even Apple. Most things you could interact with the blockchain from any computer, any desktop, in the internet, that's it. Now there's nice fancy apps and tools that are used through iPhone and other things, but they're not necessary. That's the whole point of immutable censorship resistant networks. And we need to keep that in mind whenever you think of a theory, whenever you hear speculation or you hear anything, just remember the value in these assets and these networks is because they're immutable censorship resistant open and permissionless. Always keep that in mind. If you keep that in mind in the back of your head, whenever you hear speculation, 
you'll just kind of like weed through all this other noise that's out there because it doesn't make sense when you think of that. Same goes to XRP. You notice how there's no centralized coin? Do you see a centralized coin that just one entity controls? No, because that doesn't have value because nobody would want it. So that's something just to keep in mind. Now with Flair's vote power, this wouldn't affect, um, I believe, even cracking with Flair in the US. So we'll have to see if you'll still be able to, to do that. But really, you should stake always directly with a blockchain. It's safer than using any of these exchanges. Why trust an exchange when you could go directly to the blockchain? And I know some people used Kraken because it didn't have the unbonding period on some assets. But with Flare, you could every three and a half days, you could switch who you're delegating to. So Coinbase's staking is not going anywhere. And Kraken's global staking is not going anywhere. So this is just one incident of them not disclosing the correct information. It wasn't the actual staking that's this unregistered security because I saw a lot of stuff on Twitter, tons of misinformation. And we need to under, as an XRP community and Flare community, we need to understand the broader crypto space better. DeFi, what's coming. And having this data is what allows for utility on Flare. And it's going to be, a, it's like a resource, a good that's going to earn potentially you if you're delegating or staking with an Oracle or a validator slash FTSO you'll be able to earn those outside currencies. And that's real yield, revenue. So this is the product that Flare Network produces. And it's a very difficult product to get. And the Oracle problem since the days of Vitalik in 2016 have really not been solved. Chainlink has not solved it. So there's probabilistic data and deterministic. Flare built two core protocols into the network to solve this specifically and use the network security because there's nothing more secure than a blockchain. And it runs Avalanche's Snowman++, which is a super high efficient decentralized consensus when you could run as many nodes, validators as you want. Uh, I think there would be network effects as well if people build bridges to and from uh, Flare. Um, so the more, essentially, the more going outbound and the more coming inbound, uh, the greater network effects there will be. But this allows people to either build on Flare to serve the, the Flare community itself, or it allows people to build essentially with Flare using the Oracle, using the state connector um, to serve other communities. And that's, to us, that's really the entire idea behind Connect Everything is we didn't want to just build a blockchain that was trying to compete with other layer one blockchains. We wanted to build a, a blockchain that serves as many blockchains as possible because it has really great utility. Initially, they have to bootstrap it. Remember they say, Flare says build, build on Flare or build with Flare. What does that mean? Building on Flare is like what Pangolin's doing right now. Blaze Swap, that's a DEX on Flare that you use with your Flare wallet, and it's just like being an Ethereum uh, DAP. Then there's Build with Flare. What does that mean? That means you're going to build something using their cross-chain protocols, where it's going to take in the FTSO price feeds, maybe. It's going to use the state connector to verify something. It's going to use the data relay service for something. It's going to use layer cakes assets or something. It's going to use the F assets or something cross chain. It's going to pull web two data from something. So that's building with Flare. And then there's this whole back end like verifier system. Like they don't talk about it, but it's in the GitHub. Like it's a big, a big component of what they're building. And the Google Cloud, they need to have nodes everywhere, everywhere. So having these infrastructure providers, they already have nodes on many networks. So I think that helps bootstrap that. Because you can't just say, hey, we're creating a you know, cross-chain protocol and then you know, count on a few community members to run some nodes on different networks. It's, you know, that, the effort has to be made, and it has been, because we've heard them say in the presentation that they've been working with partners for 
a while now behind the scenes and we haven't seen everything on the surface. But the verifier system, so for example, like just because the state connector attested to something, a DAP can't just take this word for it. It's got to then go and verify that attestation. So there's a API called the proof API, which they could prove that that att attestation uh, was correct. And they could do that very easily and just integrate it into their app. Because I'm sure one of the questions everyone asks is why did it take us so long to get from the, the snapshot to here? And that's yeah. because we completely rebuilt and redesigned all of the protocols from the ground up. Okay. And the reason we did that was to make them extensible beyond one network to many. And so that's like essentially the state connector was completely redesigned and required an extensive re-engineering process to make it essentially able to connect to every network. And so what Flare is today is a network that is designed not only to provide a service to the XRP ledger, but to provide essentially interoperability where possible for all blockchains. And not just blockchains, but with the internet. If the network has changed dramatically, which it has since that original snapshot. So at the time of that original snapshot, the network was designed only to be a smart contract layer that referenced the XRP ledger. In the last two years, we've completely redesigned the network. Yeah. Such that it is no longer, um, does no longer serve one network, but is itself its own network that no, can no. serve all of the networks. So not just XRP, but Bitcoin and Litecoin and Dogecoin. And, so instead of and Cosmo, being locked into that one network, you've seen the potential for the whole industry. Certainly what we call the default association provider gets gets merged. And essentially your, your stake to that um, or your delegation to one of those entities uh, would earn rewards. Uh, stake being uh, essentially locked up and 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 essentially uh, not not at risk from slashing. We we're not necessarily intending to uh, put forward a proposal that has slashing. So we're looking at uh, you know can, can we integrate staking into the FTSO validator component? Uh, the staking component would earn uh, more than the delegation component. Uh, the staking component would only be a small uh, percentage of of the uh, total. Uh, amount that is delegated. And do you think that that market is predominantly an institutional market then? Or do you, do you foresee a lot more retail adoption driving the growth within Flare? I, I hope it's both. Mm -hmm. um, to me, institutions are fantastic, uh, you know, and are obviously adopting this space quickly. Um, but this is about decentralization. This is decentralized finance for a reason. Uh, if it's not available to retail, then there's very little point of doing it as institutions are already capable of accessing any type of finance that they wish to access.